start with first talk. These nice guys will introduce themselves, mm -hmm. I hope, yep. right? Yep. And here we go. Cool. Thank you for your introduction. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, if you want to tweet today, we, we just came up with a nice um, hashtag called front book. Um, so, uh, the Wi Fi is, uh, you probably have seen a password for the free Wi Fi here, so feel free to tweet and share information. Um, so, I would like to welcome you to our talk about um, the current state of uh, prototyping for VR. Um, the next 30 minutes, we want to give you uh, an overview about this new exciting medium and what you can do with it. Um, actually, the example is pretty nice because I think it shows you that in prototyping, you just do something and for the sake of testing, and then maybe the whole thing can crash and you throw your code away, and then you just. <laughs> that's prototyping. Um, good, so this is us, um, Xavo on my left our interaction designer uh, for VR at the Litex, and me, Thomas, uh, head of UX, um, both kind of obviously excited about VR. Um, me a little bit more than... <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, sorry, I just found out that I have to plug in my um, power. Maybe you can help me out while I'm... Okay, good. Um, so... Who had a VR experience uh, in general, like using HTC Vive or cardboard hands up? Okay. Um, who developed some VR experience already? Okay, not so many. <laughs> Great. Um, we will talk about this later. Um, before I go into too much depth about what we are going, um, what we are doing at Delightex and our product CoSpaces, I just brought a short product video which is quite fresh out of the oven. Introducing CoSpaces, a platform that allows anyone to create, explore and share fantasy worlds. CoSpaces gives you the tools to unlock a new learning experience, tell exciting stories or just let your imagination flow. Unlimited worlds await to be explored even in VR. Share the experience with your family or scare them with your terrifying T-Rex. Share your creations with anyone and give them a glimpse into your imagination. Okay, so this is what we do. We are developing CoSpaces. Um, you can uh, register at CoSpaces.io to check it out. It's currently for free. Um, it's a platform for creative people to build uh, your own VR worlds and experiences and share them with your network and, and your friends across many devices. So it's a multi-platform uh, approach. You can go on the uh, studio uh, studio.cospaces.io, build your own stuff immediately have it on your mobile device, like Android devices, iOS devices, and uh, you can see and prototype very quick and see what you're doing, plus send this and share this with, with your friends and, and, and family and so on. Um, about VR, um, you probably heard of it. It's, uh, it's still quite a hype around VR. Um, <laughs> with such numbers like $30 billion of VR revenue, a share estimated by 2020. Uh, major players like Facebook, Google, um, Sony, HTC are um, taking a bet on it, actually. Um, so, but why does it, what, what does it really uh, take to, um, to join the VR train? What do you have to know about it? Um, so we want to talk about requirements. Um, best practices and uh, the prototyping process in general. So um, what can, what, how do you develop for, for VR? Um, if, as we talk about requirements, um, first of all, we want to understand what VR is. Actually, it's um, nothing else than a screen in front of your eyes with a stereoscopic view um, involving head tracking and sound. So uh, you get this illusion that you are somewhere else. Uh, this illusion is called immersion. Um, immersion into virtual reality is a perception of being physically present in a non-physical world. It's like the official um, um, 
kind of um, description. So what can I do there if I'm immersed in, in this virtual world? Um, what's quite popular right now, you can uh, watch a movie. There's a nice app called Within VR. Uh, they have tons of uh, 360 movie material, very professionally made from, from uh, Hollywood filmmakers. Uh, you have Google Spotlight Stories. They take a more creative approach on storytelling in VR. Um, so uh, you can check those out and on, on your smartphone. Um, you can dive into another world, um, going into times where you normally don't have access, like Dino Trek uh, VR is doing it, so you go into um, the dinosaur age, or you go uh, deep dive underwater with some sharks. Um, so these are kind of uh, experience you normally don't have. Um, and more scenarios for VR, uh, actually gaming is quite, quite hot, um, movies as I told you. Um, we ourselves, for co-spaces, we experience a lot of interest from education, so teachers um, and kids interested in storytelling, creating uh, virtual exhibitions. Um, the uh, immersive journalism is also a, a hot topic that actually it's, for journalists it's not enough that you just um, write an article about what happened, so you really want to get people immersed into what happened. Mm -hmm. So. Um, imagine the, the bombings in Brussels, for example, so that you are in this uh, terminal and that you see where the terrorists came from. So you are really a part of the whole story, not just like thinking about it, how it was. Um, we also talk with city planners. Um, they just want to know how does it uh, feel when we like create this new building? How will it influence our city? And uh, yeah, it goes to dating, team collaboration and porn. Um, porn was always a driver for um, new, new technologies and I think it will be a, a gigantic driver for VR as well. In Japan they already developed some kind of physical hardware so you have your headset on and then you can rub a robotic... Okay, I don't want to go into deep <laughs> into this kind of thing but you can already imagine. <laughs> Just go to Google search for VR porn Japanese hardware and then you will find it. <laughs> um, okay, ergonomic requirements um, is something very important to consider. It goes about field of view and the range of motion. There's a very nice talk from uh, Mike Alga from Google VR um, or the latest one about designing for Daydream. And he came uh, up with uh, this kind of 30 degree uh, field of view which is like the area where you can see sharp and everything um, is, is quite crisp in this area. And the 80 degrees are like the range of motion when I look to the left and when I look to the right, which feels kind of comfortable to look. Um, and then we have this 120 degree of maximal um, range of motion, which means I have to bend my head already, which is quite uncomfortable and you should not do it so often in your application. And we also have the, the range actually. So um, 0 0.5 to 1 meter is the range where you should not interfere with the personal space of the user. Uh, while uh, 20 meters or within 20 meters is the space where you can uh, get a feeling for, for depth and feeling for the space. Everything above 20 meters is just far away. So this is kind of the, the area where we can um, develop actually. Uh, I also like the idea of a concept where, so that you can give this zones uh, names and, and place kind of content there. There's the main content zone, which makes sense for the, uh, for the um, 30 degrees uh, zone. In the peripheral zone, you can put um, secondary or tertiary uh, functionality. Um, the so-called no-no zone in the middle is something, yeah, just don't, don't touch. Don't put like a screen or something right in front of your eye except you want to scare the people, of course. Um, and there's the so-called curiosity zone in the back. Um, I saw this in um, interesting games like Land's End, where they use this to inform the user what, what the app is actually doing, how the whole thing works. And then it's just like, okay, after you read this and you understand what it's all about, please just turn around and then the game starts. So you can use it as an introductory point. Um, yeah, the same for like looking up and down. We have similar um, degree of radius, so this 30 degrees, but it just goes slightly uh, um, a little bit underneath of your uh, view. 
when we talk about ergonomic requirements, also keep in mind that there are two different ways of VR. There's a seated VR, where you just sit down, you are limited in motion. So you cannot just walk around. You can only, for example, if you're sitting on a couch and there's something behind your back and then you really have to, to turn your head, which is pretty annoying. While in standing VR, you can just freely walk around, look around, and you have much less um, um, limitations. Uh, from technical requirements, of course, uh, we also have these ones, uh, devices and interactions. Um, if you think that um, responsive design was or is a challenge, then uh, welcome to VR, because we have a lot of different um, interactions and hardware as well. So one of the most popular one is cardboard. Um, over 6 million cardboards are sold so far. Um, the 2.0 version at least offers you a button to interact. I mean, imagine this, you're in a virtual world and the only thing what you can do is press a button, nothing else. So it feels like you are strapped to a chair and you can only like press one button, that's it, which is not really exciting. Um, but so far still, because of the price of 15 euro or for the uh, Mattel Viewmaster, it's like 25 euros on Amazon, it's the entry drug for the VR um, enthusiasts. Uh, we have another one, which is my personal favorite for um, mobile headsets, is the Gear VR. Uh, if you have some Samsung S7, S6 device, uh, you can put it straight in. It only costs 100 euro, but it comes with a touchpad and a back button. Um, like I say, never under underestimate a back button. It's always good to have a specific hard key to, to go back, to leave an experience, to go out of something very quick. Um, especially in VR. And something more interesting coming this fall will be the Google Daydream headset. It will come with a um, three degrees of freedom controller. It's actually like a Wii controller. Um, it offers you a touchpad and two buttons. So um, this makes interacting in VR um, a little bit more interesting at least. So they are uh, also estimated to cost around about 100 euros, so they want to um, tackle the Gear VR market. Um, so this is, was this was it uh, from the from the mobile VR experiences. So you take your smartphone and just put it into this headset, and then there are more like room scale VR, more high end solutions uh, for around about 800 euros. You get the HTC Vive. Um, with a six degrees of freedom uh, control, two, two um, of them actually. Um, they are tracked in space, which is really nice and really uh, good tracking for the ones who, who experienced it. Um, and then there's the Oculus Rift. They still don't have their um, controllers out. They only offer you a joystick right now, which is, uh, uh, no, not a joystick, uh, they offer you a gamepad which is not really nice to use in, in VR, um, because I think in this new kind of interesting medium, you also have to uh, redefine the interaction methods you, you have. So when you want to develop a uh, VR experience, one question actually is for which kind of device and for which kind of platform. So if you want to develop for Google Cardboard, uh, just a developer App Store or Google Play um, application. If you want to be on Gear VR, you have to be at the Oculus Home Store. The good thing, if you made it to Oculus Home Store, you're also on the Oculus Rift device, so they are kind of linked. Uh, and then there's Steam VR, which is a specific um, platform for games in order to be on, on HTC Vive. So this is uh, one question you have to, to, to think about. From statistics, there was recently um, a poll about um, what is the most popular platform and um, Google Cardboard devices won for mobile VR and uh, Steam VR and HTC Vive won for room scale VR. So when we ask developers what is the platform you like to develop for. Um, then I want to speak about beyond the VR controller. So VR controllers are right now the current state of what is supposed to be good interaction technique. But um, if you look at leap motion, then we also have hand tracking, which becomes more interesting. They still have some problems to, to deal with. For example, recently they, they figured out how they can still track hands if they go, go crosswise and they don't lose the signal. Um, the other thing is uh, eye tracking. So there's a nice um, headset coming out from Get Both or Both VR headset, which means that 
you right now you have to to look into the direction where you want to spot so you have to move your whole head in order to for example if i want to look to the window i have to move my head to the window if i want to look back i have to move my head back and with eye tracking you can just keep your view uh, you can keep your head and view um, and, and look around which is pretty nice and then mind events that you can actually through through the headset and um, tackling your um, or tracking your brain activity you can move things so like for future. Um, human, requirements, human requirements, if we talk about uh, uh, this, we also have to talk about VR sickness. VR sickness is actually called a sensory cue mismatch between visual, um, perspe visual perception and the vestibular system. What does it mean? It means that uh, if you feel sitting, but you see that you are moving, makes you feel uncomfortable. You probably have uh, experienced it uh, already. Another approach or another theory is the theory with the poison berries. So um, if you're lacking or if, like, uh, if you have uh, um, high latency, um, then your image is a little bit blurred and your head thinks, mm, maybe I'm poisoned, so I have to get the stuff out. This is another theory what, what can cause that. Um, there are actually two, uh, two solutions for that. Um, one is a technical solution, which means please uh, keep your uh, frame rate at least at 60 frames per second. Uh, 90 frames per second is recommended. PlayStation VR even has 120 frames per second. Um, so if the frame rate or tracking precision is too low, we have, to, uh, we have a sensory cue mismatch again. Um, the same for the controllers. So you have to ensure that the controllers always have uh, high precision, low latency tracking so that if I move the device uh, in the real world, it also moves in, in the um, virtual world. If it's not connected, then I feel awkward and probably mess everything up. Um, another design solution is for example you can place if you for example fly around with which is one of the worst things you can do in vr um, you place uh, a bird in the in the center of the view which means it helps you to focus at some spot and makes you feel less less uh, less bad uh, another study which recently came out is the so-called uh, design solution of a reducing uh, field of view you can see it so as you're moving uh, forward they um, decrease the level of, of sight, which feel, makes you feel a little bit more comfortable because you don't see all the things around you moving. Um, this can also reduce VR sickness. We, we tried it ourselves uh, for, for our product, and it's really, um, it's really, really helpful. The only problem is um, that you reduce the feeling of immersion a bit. Um, but this is, yeah, you, so you have to balance this, this kind of trade-off. So this was about uh, requirements. Now I want to show you some uh, best practices, design patterns for VR. Um, actually, there are not so many like for web or um, for mobile, but there are already some. Um, if we think about selecting, for example, if you want to select things in VR, there's a so-called reticle. A reticle gives you orientation in space. It's this little white dot, um, which just um, helps you to, to figure out where I am in space. You can use it like a virtual mouse, actually. Um, so it helps you to identify which objects have interactions or which, which don't have interactions. So you can have hover states as well. Uh, you can spot and select elements with the reticle. Um, you can also use it uh, and replace it with a, a 3D element, for example. Um, so it's also similar to the mouse cursor when you hover a button and it turns into a hand, for example. So you can. Um, actually take the cursor and, and change it um, regarding what, what you're actually with what you're actually um, interacting with and this is a nice example from from um, Google VR labs so they take uh, the reticle and replace it with a little plant everywhere you look around on the spot you, you just press the button because you only have one button um, but uh, everywhere you press you will plant a new new flower um, Another um, alternative from the early days of VR is the fuse button. Um, it's this thing where you, in the times where you don't have any button at all, in order to select something, you just stare at it and wait until the, the circle uh, is filling up. 
this is actually one of the worst experiences I really hated, and I hope this thing dies, because um, it makes you very uncomfortable. Uh, you just want to look around, and you don't want to activate something, but by accident, um, something just pops up, you're in another menu, then you have to figure out to come back, but then you suddenly, by accident, you hit something else, so the whole idea of a fuse button uh, is um, probably, hopefully, not needed anymore. But I just wanted to quote it to be precise. Um, another thing about selecting um, is, you can see it from time to time, so-called ground menu. So they use the space. You can, re can you remember the ergonomic requirements? So there's the space underneath of you, um, which can be used as a peripheral zone. Um, so they, they use it, for example, to go back, um, to go to a dashboard, to go to some like additional settings, wh whatever. So the space underneath of you, it's something you usually don't look so much in VR. So this is used for like additional information. Um, we talk about selecting. If you have a controller, uh, laser pointing, or so-called ray casting, is um, actually one of the best experiences so far. So you can see it right here uh, in a daydream um, um, example. So you have your controller, and where you ever, wherever you look, you see this as an extension of your controller. So it actually acts like a like a laser pointer. So Wherever I look, I spot this thing, pick it up, and put it somewhere else, for example. Um, it feels a little bit like this go-go guachetto arm thing, that I just extend the thing what I have in my um, hand, which is um, pretty cool. So I don't have to travel so much as well. For example, if I want to take this thing very far behind, um, I just take it. So another um, menu for, for actually real controllers is um, a nice example is the controller menu from a tilt brush. So if you really have an interface with a lot of um, abstract information, <laughs> like picking a color, picking a brush, picking different kinds of tools, um, they just map it on the controller and you can uh, rotate your controller in order to access it. You can even put um, more complex menus inside this kind of uh, controller. Um, it's pretty helpful for more abstract, more complex interfaces in VR. Um, the same for uh, dashboards. Um, it's a so-called spatial UI, which means you have still a 2D interface, but in a, mapped into a 3D world. Um, one example is the, the older version of Oculus Home Store. Um, so what you see is uh, an environment still in 3D. Um, you should not ignore the environment, even, even if it's just a focus on, on the dashboard here, because um, it also is a part of the whole experience which makes you feel more or less comfortable. So please don't just take a, just a gray space um, without any details. So whether they, you see like they put you in a nice um, house or they put you onto a green field or into the forest or something, it make, makes you feel a little bit more comfortable. And then you have, in your main content zone, you have uh, additional UI elements which um, rotate through or open up or unfold in this kind of main content zone. Um, we also have today uh, display text. We can treat it like a head-up display. So it's actually augmented reality in virtual reality. So you have your space around yourself and then you can display information in one meter or one and a half meter distance, so out of this so-called no-no zone, but still quite close to you. So everything around you is moving, but still you can focus on, on, um, on information. Um, there's also this idea of text display in the space. So wherever you look around, for example, in this, um, in this nice uh, thing here, you can just click on any object and you get additional information about it, like text. You can also imagine video content or web, other kind of web content embedded there. Um, but it's still attached to the, to the object, so this is one way how you can do it. Or like in IKEA VR app, um, they, they, they use text in order to show what you can do with a specific object, so they overlay it on the object. So this is uh, also a way how you can, how you can treat text in, in, in VR. Um, one recommendation, actually, what, um, what we found out and what the whole VR community is talking about are so-called uh, diegetic UI solutions. So whenever you 
um, have to make a decision how you present information in space, try to make it with real patterns. Uh, one example is uh, Job Simulator. So for, you see there's real um, there's a real data you can you can take and put it inside. Yeah, there's a real slider. There's a real um, button or something you, you can you can you can press. So in order to get the highest degree of immersion, um, you should uh, take a diegetic UI solution, which means actually you're taking a real-world metaphor and put it into into VR because it feels quite natural, and um, this is uh, what what's actually quite fun also to use if you have played around with Job Simulator uh, recently. Um, then the thing what I told you, um, moving in VR actually not uh, a very, very good experience. Uh, one strategy is so-called teleporting. So you can teleport inside a space. Uh, there's many research about it. Um, this is an example from HTC Vive Labs. Um, you can uh, just point anywhere in the space and wherever you press you will jump there so there's a hot cut and then you will go there uh, there's a hot cut because um, if you just move your move the person very quick there without any uh, so with a smooth transition uh, you still will feel um, VR sickness pretty uh, pretty pretty soon um, in many research they actually say it's not so good because the, the downside of this um, teleporting is that the user just um, loses control so I stand here, then I click, and suddenly I'm here. Like, what, what happened? So, but you can get used to it, and um, because of a lack of better alternatives, it's still very often used. You can see this a lot. Uh, you can also see this if you don't have a VR controller. You just have, for example, a button in cardboard. What they do here, they move you, but you can see they try to move you very slow. So it's really like yeah, cycling through, through the space, actually. Never put uh, people on, on, a, on a Porsche or something and, and ride them through VR. Um, this was also a nice idea about uh, like this metaphor of throwing bombs into space. So wherever I put this, this bomb, I will jump there. But you can see that it goes very quick and sometimes you even have no idea where did I came from, where I am. And it, but is it, this is for a game and if it's a part of the game, then it's fine. But if you want to have a nice experience, you better think about it. Um, so there's also teleporting out of space, um, which is a nice example. We also had this idea when we were thinking about it. Um, hmm, well, we could take a bowl and put a preview image of the other world inside, and then as you want to dive into this world, you just take it or you click on it, and then you go into this world. And then two weeks later, we saw this HTC Vive Lab at the end, and so maybe it was too obvious. <laughs> But sometimes the obvious um, uh, can be good uh, also for, for user expectations. Um, moving free walking, there are actually a lot of experiments going on. One of my favorite examples is this one, when, when the guy uses the uh, Vive controller to make this kind of gesture. And depending on where he's looking and moving and how fast he's really moving, he's moving into this direction. Um, there's also a Google uh, VR um, experience from Daydream Labs where they replace uh, the controllers in virtual reality with two, two shoes and you look down and if you move your uh, controllers you move the shoes and then you move through the space which is also like kind of interesting idea but probably not for one hour foot walk. So um, text input is something we actually overlooked <laughs> a bit. Um, there's an opportunity uh, to use more speech actually, especially for mobile VR. Um, only problem is what are you doing with sensitive data like um, password entry or um, you want to play around or search for something while people are standing around you, it can be awkward. Um, so still, uh, as you can see here, um, I would point this out, you, you have the opportunity uh, to use speech but you can also switch to a, to a keyboard in VR and you use it with your reticle and then you select keys. It actually works uh, quite, quite good. This is an example from Gear VR, the uh, Samsung browser uh, with the YouTube version of it. And as we were developing actually um, on CoSpaces, we found out that there's no, S there's no single SDK out there which provides a keyboard for VR, so we had to build our keyboard on, on our own, but this is another story. Um, 
So um, I want to talk about sound as well, because it's also something which is overlooked uh, and has still a lot of potential. So if you want to provide a user with guidance before you think about, mm, oh, well, I just put a text um, display in front of his eyes where I tell him where to go and how, how this whole thing works, uh, think about using audio feedback. Um, there's a nice example from Esper for Oculus. Hello, and welcome to the ESVR training program. My name is, uh, oh, let's just get on with it already. In the drawer to your left, yada, 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 puzzle cue, you're a genius, good luck. Hello and welcome to the ESPR. So you see, I think it's also quite personal and nice and also helps the immersion. So as soon as you put a display in front of people's head, the chance that you, you, you still have this kind of feeling, hmm, I'm probably in a virtual world. Um, um, this is something you don't want to have, so this kind of audio uh, guidance is pretty helpful. Um, and another thing is like the same with, like you know it from movies, uh, sound or spatial audio supports the whole immersion. For example, if you look at this um, user interface dashboard from Gunjack uh, VR without any sound, I mean, what is it? It's just some UI pattern, um, so you look around, you don't really have a feeling of being there. You have a feeling of being there, but if you um, compare it with this one, So, and you also have this, this kind of uh, diegetic uh, interface sound plus sound effects, which really adds, which really make the whole experience much, much nicer. That's it for me so far. For the last point, prototyping uh, process, I want to hand over to Xava. I just have to unwire myself. And um, yeah. Welcome, mm -hmm. Xava, on the stage. Uh. That's what it is. Uh, okay, hello everybody. So, yeah, I will talk a bit about uh, the actual prototyping process so that you create a build, uh, usable prototype and start testing it. So, what I do at um, Delightex, I, I do also some research. I work on, on a um, a building tool for the HTC Vive. So we want to create something where pretty much everybody can just go in, use this tool and build the castles, for example. And there I'm doing a lot of user testing, research, and yeah. Then the other part what I usually do is working on code spaces on the product itself. And there I'm mainly responsible for all the interactions that have to do with VR. So I will just give like one example task now I had and just explain a bit the, the process. So one thing is you see here this, this dashboard. So at the moment it works like this in CoSpace. You take your laptop or PC, you build something, you have created a space and then you want to see it. So you have to, you take the app, you open one of these spaces in the dashboard and once you're in you can switch to VR mode. Ah, there's the video. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> there you can see it. So here you can see the VR button on the right, and then you're in VR. Okay, and now we said it would also be cool if I can just like have this whole um, experience in VR. So also the dashboard should be in VR. And then, okay, the question is how do you design this stuff? Because there are not so many guidelines yet, there are a few examples, but still it would be cool to have a nice usable prototype and test it a bit, and then hand it over to developers and let them uh, make it production ready. So. First thing what we can always recommend is just prototype in, in real world. So just see, don't think how would you do it on a computer, but how would you do stuff in real, real life. So this is more like a laser pointer example, but you can see, you can just stand up and, and try things, play around, see how, how it feels, how you like it. And yeah, <laughs> you can see it. Okay, but if you really want to test it in VR, we usually do this um, with Unity. So I usually create these prototypes. There's no, no tool like Axure or something for, for user interfaces in VR. So actually, you need to do some coding. So yeah, with Unity, you just use um, C Sharp. And it's actually built for, uh, made for building games. But it became like the tool mainly to also create VR content. Because you, yeah, you can easily convert games into VR. 
applications. Um, and yeah, what I feel there, what is also quite interesting, so I'm mostly an uh, interaction designer, but because I have to work a lot with Unity and create all these prototypes, sometimes the main workload shifts more to like solving technical problems, how to implement certain interactions. But this makes the work also more interesting and more, more right. Hmm? Ah, true. Who has, who has tested Unity before? Has anybody played with Unity around? Okay, so not so much. Okay, so I can give a little introduction. So what you have is like, like this, on the left you have the big um, scene view, so you can arrange your 3D objects. You have the, the game view where you can see like a preview of, of how it will look like. You have the hierarchy and you have all your assets where you have 3D objects, code, um, sound effects, images, and all the stuff you put together. And the cool thing here is you have this, this nice asset store which really helps for prototyping. So you can just go in there, say I need some, some like I had it here, some, some low poly objects. So I, I get there, see what they have and get them to drop them in to, to get a kind of a nice environment. I can find code snippets, I can find UI elements, some editor extensions so I can really customize it and find stuff to start quickly and prototype something. Then what you need for VR is like depending on which platform you work, for example for um, VR, Google VR or Cardboard, you just get the Google VR SDK, you pretty much download it, import it into Unity and you can start. And there are two nice things, so they have, um, they have like example scenes, so you can just take their scenes, see how they build it and, and check it out and maybe change it a bit. Or you can even take your existing Unity project and convert them quite quickly to a VR project. Yeah? Question, can you create also your own objects? Yeah, uh, no, you mean like 3D models? Yeah. No, that's not in Unity. So this is what you would do in Blender, Maya, whatever, and then you import it. You can have basic cubes, but you cannot really model. Okay, so then, yeah, you, you have these scenes, you can test them, you can convert an existing game to a VR game, which is technically quite easy, but to get all these interactions we saw before, you need to adapt it actually quite a lot. And then, what I also use a lot there is also, I got it from the asset store, it's like a nice tweening engine. So I guess also for front-end developers, animation is, is super important and in VR it gets like three times more important even because you feel it, it's, it's a very strange feeling if you just pop out windows, just don't, don't guide the user's view. So you need to animate a lot actually and there this comes, comes quite handy. So you, you have this tween engine, you you add this, this code to an object and you pretty much just say, okay, I, I want to move it or I want to change the opacity or whatever. I choose which object to do it, I choose the goal, the timing, and that's it. And then I can go more and say, okay, I want a nice easing, so to, to make it accelerate or slow down, and I can set a delay. And with this simple code snippets, I can build pretty much all, all the animations I need for, for a VR UI. And then, Okay, so now I want to explain a bit how we actually convert this, this um, 2D dashboard to VR. So what we need to think about. So one thing is especially sizes and distances. So in, on, on a screen you have pretty much, you only define the sizes and the positioning, but in VR you also get the depths, the 3D uh, positioning. So you can make something very, very big, but if it's far away it still seems small and you shouldn't put stuff too close. And so. It's quite hard to, to imagine that in 2D or to build it before, so you need to really experience in VR. So you shift it around a lot, look at it in VR, shift it around, and make it better by this way. You, another nice um, way to arrange object is actually if you make this in a circle around the user, so when he looks to the side, the stuff is not far away, but still quite close to him, so it's easier to read. You need to think about uh, stuff like, okay, I cannot scroll, so I need to somehow flip to the pages. So we had these, these buttons for left and right. Um, we, the, um, one big question was also, like, you, you, if you build a thing, it's, it's quite big, actually. And if you just stand on the ground and see this giant interface in front of you, it almost threatens you a bit. You feel like, oh, I'm very small, and this almost looks scary to me. So what, what was my idea then? Okay, well, let's place the user higher and a bit further away, and so up in VR you don't want them just to fly and then look down and the ground is so far away so I place them on this little little rock kind of thing so if it feels more natural um, yeah that's I think the most important thing when 
what we discovered when we designed this. And here you can you can see a video of the that are recorded inside of Unity how how the whole thing looks. So you have yeah a lot of hover animations. You just move this back and forward. You we also like quickly prototype the login experience. So you can see this uh, step a bit, and then you go in, and then you have these side panels, which also give you more options. And then, question. yeah. So, is these are these basic graphics here SVGs? Mm, no, actually, it's all PNGs. So, you, you this is actually uh, SVGs would, in, would be nice, but you cannot do this in Unity yet. So, you usually, you actually, this was a bit annoying. So, I have to create the, the these shapes in the right sizes and put them in, and then use this. So, it, it's mainly PNGs. You can color it. So, you use just white PNGs and color it a bit. Um, the keyboard yeah. that you had was it like? Did you just connect the keyboard to it, or was you had to really to go with your eyes? That's exactly what you need to do. So, you need to see. Good, good. Really? Yeah. So luckily, we would also have a login with Facebook in the future, but this needs needs to work. But yeah, this is this is uh, quite. A, it, it's not as bad as it sounds actually to <laughs> to use this VR keyboard. Um, yeah. So then another thing that I always thought about. So yeah, again, this keyboard. So as we saw before in the examples. Um, there are some nice examples of these keyboards you, we, we saw on other other apps, so we thought, okay, it doesn't make sense that I, as a prototyper, try this whole thing. And so we said, okay, no, we just make the, the rough design and like give a give an idea, and then the the real implementation the developers will do. Because otherwise, it's like I do this the whole work and then they do the whole work again. And that is always a bit of question when you create these prototypes, how much into detail you should get. Because it's quite easy to, to get lost and say, okay, I want to add all these animations, all this stuff. But you usually just want to prototype that detailed enough to test what you want to test. And testing is also a good word. So that's the cool thing you can do if you have the prototype before you, you don't need for, to wait for the developer, but you just say, I grab my cardboard, I grab my HTC, and I let someone use it. And then I can quickly see what works, what doesn't work. And I can also just, okay, I see this thing doesn't work, I quickly change the code, and then the same day I can make another test. And yeah, there I saw one, one nice thing for this example before. So I gave this prototype to someone and they asked me if they can log in with my Facebook. And of course the button did not do anything, but it, it showed me, okay, they don't understand that it's a prototype, so the feedback I get will be kind of valuable. And, and now, mm -hmm. how long does it take for you to make a prototype? It can be in a day, it depends on, I mean, this one took more, took longer, but most simple interactions you do in a day, I would say. When you say this, you mean like this uh, screen, kind of with these movements, or... Yeah, for screen. example, let's say the, the this this whole lo login keyboard thing, this I would say is like okay. maybe a day. Yeah. And then, yeah, this is my cousin using the HTC Vive. <coughs> And then the question is how to hand it over to development. So there you, we feel it also gives some advantages if, if um, the interaction designer knows some coding. So our actual uh, platform, so CoSpace, is written completely in Java. So they, they don't use Unity. They created their own, um, uh, own engine, own API, own physics, everything to have like the full control and freedom. So one thing I give them is like the, the specs for sizes. So I try to show them exactly where to play stuff so that it looks quite similar when, I, when they, they build it and it's easy to do for them. And then the other thing, for example, for this animation, of course I can just hand over some code snippets because they are also coders and they can easily read this. And this also speeds up the process because I can just drop in these, these code snippets and they know what to do. And here is like a short preview so we, we changed the background also a bit so this is how it looks actually in the Gear VR version then. And then you, you you check it. You give them feedback what to what to change or what is what is fine for you. So this is like the the whole process how we usually do it. And yeah, if you got interested a bit in the whole topic, so prototyping for VR and in, in general VR, I can um, recommend this resource. So it's like a quite nice list. You find articles, videos, um, a lot of talks. So there's also a talk from Thomas in there already. So just scroll through and start reading, start looking at it, it's quite quite nice. 
And yeah, another thing to, to say, so yeah, it's, it's pioneer work, baby. So we, we, we feel like, or I think we heard it heard in a talk, it's a bit like, like web designing in the 90s. So, you, so there are not so many guidelines yet. So many people are trying new things, want to create things that become guidelines. So it's, it's moving very fast. So you can, it's, it's quite hard to keep up. So there's so much stuff to read and so much to find out and so much research. But still, also so many unsolved problems, so it's, it's a quite interesting area to research and also to work in. Um, and then, yeah, of course, if you <laughs> are interested in, in VR or in, in, in building or 3D environments, then I think it would be nice to, to have a look at Delightex if you're interested. So we are, of course, looking for new people and hiring, so you can yeah, talk to us. And yeah, one more thing we want to say. So, also inside of CoSpaces, we want to implement or add a function to code a bit. So now they're actually already testing a bit to say, not just build spaces in CoSpace, but build little games. So now there are some people testing it, writing the API, and want to play around with this. Yeah. And for this, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can, I can keep it out. <laughs> this is, this is funny. Um, for this, yeah, we, we will hand out a, a list of, uh, with, with emails uh, where you can write on your email and you can sign up for early access. So if you are interested in doing this kind of stuff, you can, you can sign up there and you can test this a bit. So you will be like part of the whole, whole development. So yeah, you can get all these exam this example here on, on GitHub. You can see how, how they, they, they did this and then you can, yeah, just play around with it and maybe hack a bit. It's, it's not as far from finished, but it would be cool if you are interested. Um, one, one, one last thing to add. Um, yeah? Actually, yeah, so about, about the scripting engine so far, um, it's, it's all based on JavaScript. So how many of you know JavaScript? Good. Good. <laughs> um, <laughs> very nice. So if, if you um, look at Unity, for example, you have to learn uh, C Sharp. How many of you know C Sharp? Okay. Also, <laughs> but JavaScript was more. Okay, anyhow, um, so it's uh, CoSpaces is, is like I said, uh, a multi-platform tool. You can access it in your browser. Um, you can already start playing around with it. We have a um, actual a current version of CoSpaces right here, you can, so you can test it later. Um, the only thing what is currently missing is this whole scripting, adding interactivity, and we, we are building our. We already have our own API, and we we played. Um, we played around with it and we created this little game. We actually created two games, to be honest. And uh, yeah, now we want to open this thing up and want to get your feedback. So <coughs> please just come, sign up, um, play around with, with the API and, and give us feedback. When we are curious about what you're going to do in VR with some lines of JavaScript. Um, so... Questions? Hasta la vista. Thank you. <laughs> Time for <a> <laughs>